Hello, my name is Peter Oreo, and today's talk is called The Role of Prostate Brachytherapy in Gleason Score 8 through 10 Disease. What I'd like to do today is discuss brachytherapy's role in high risk prostate cancer, or review randomized trials, or compare outcomes of brachytherapy to surgery and external beam radiation therapy, as well as some technical considerations of why there's a benefit in ways to minimize toxicity. Brachytherapy, as we know, are seeds or catheters within the prostate gland. It's a transperoneal approach to either provide low dose rate or high dose rate brachytherapy. When we talk about brachytherapy or any data for that matter, it's always important to just frame our reference. We all look at different things and see different things. Some of you looking at my screen may see a nice young woman right here, and some might be seeing an older lady. I think we all can agree though that prostate brachytherapy is the ultimate team sport. It takes a urologist, a physicist, a radiation oncologist to do it well. Some will argue though that we don't get paid appropriately. We don't make enough money for this life-saving and curative procedure. It takes more time to do, and some would argue that circling a prostate is a whole lot easier than going to the OR to perform a high quality implant. So let's talk a little bit about high-risk prostate cancer. I like to show this report because it's the largest prostatectomy series of over 12,000 patients to report cause-specific survival in the PSA era. It's from top institutions, but what's unique about this is they report their cause-specific survival by biopsy Gleason score, not what happened after the surgery was performed, but going into the surgery just on the biopsy results themselves. This is what radiation oncologists are faced with all the time. And we can see what high-risk cancer, these are the men who die. These are the men who absolutely need to be treated so we can save their lives. Men with T3 disease have a 38% chance of prostate cancer-specific mortality. Patients with Gleason score 8, 9, and 10 disease, high-risk disease, have a 34% chance of prostate cancer-specific mortality. And then if we look at the long-term surgical biochemical progression-free survival outcomes with Gleason biopsy greater than 8, and you look at the surgical literature from top institutions, you can see the biochemical progression-free survival is on the order of 30 to 40%. That means that 60 to 70% of these men are going to fail, and many are going to need expensive and toxic salvage treatments. I always like to show Peter Grimm's work. He was a mentor of mine when I was in Seattle, and he did the comparative analysis of prostate-specific antigen on survival outcomes of patients with low, intermediate, and high-risk cancer cancers. This is the high-risk graph. What he's essentially trying to show is that there are different uh, modalities of treating prostate cancer and they all have different outcomes and some are good early on and some have more durable control. But the bottom line of this slide is that external beam and brachytherapy with or without hormonal therapy has better PSA free progression than surgery or external beam radiation therapy by itself. Now, there, are, uh, there is a lot of data in this space. There's four uh, phase three clinical trials showing that when you add brachytherapy to external beam radiation therapy, your outcomes are improved and there's about an 88 to 100% freedom from biochemical failure. But we also have three randomized trials in this space, which is actually, actually pretty unique, comparing external beam with or without brachytherapy. So let's look at these three trials in more detail. The first one is an older trial published in 2005. It was higher risk patients, T3, T2, uh, T2 and T3. They were negatively staged, but basically was comparing external beam radiation therapy with external beam radiation therapy plus an iridium implant. That's the old days of low dose rate where you'd go to the hospital for 48, day, uh, 48 hours and have the iridium deposit its dose. Now, again, these fractionation schedules are somewhat light by today's standards, but again, this was published in 2005, but the story is very interesting. After a median follow-up of 8.2 years, the patients who were treated with combined modality had a brachytherapy component, had half of the biochemical failures than those with radiation alone. The overall survival between the two groups was the same. However, when you looked at the positive biopsy rate two years post-treatment, it was half in the combined modality arm, showing that brachytherapy and dose escalation is meaningful. The more cancer cells we kill, the higher the probability the cancer doesn't grow back and cause PSAs to rise or local recurrences to occur. Now we can look at another more contemporary, but still a little bit older study with high dose rate brachytherapy in combination with external beam radiation therapy. 
again, higher risk patients with PSAs all the way up to 50. And essentially what we see is they're comparing external beam radiation therapy and hyperfractionation with a hyperfractionated uh, regimen to external beam radiation, hyperfractionated again with high dose rate boosts. Again, we can argue that the doses today are a little higher, but they're not too far off. But the story is the same. With a median follow-up of 85 months, the median time to relapse is better when we use brachytherapy as a component of care. If we look at the biochemical relapse through survival at five, seven, and 10 years, it's better with combined modality treatment. Now, again, the overall survival estimates are about the same because why we can salvage many men if they fail, but when we have to give salvage treatments, they're expensive and their quality of life reducing to many of our men. And the interesting thing in this trial, at least, there was no difference in urinary or bowel toxicity between the groups that received just external beam radiation therapy or those that have received external beam radiation therapy and a prostate brachytherapy boost. But let's turn our attention to the more contemporary trial. This is the ascend -RT trial. And this was uh, just recently published back in about 2016. But this is a trial which was taking high risk men in high intermediate risk men by the NCCN risk stratification and randomized between 12 months of ADT in both groups, 46 gray of whole pelvic, pelvic radiation in both groups, which is a contemporary standard, and either dose escalation to 78 gray to the prostate or using a LDR brachytherapy boost, 115 gray to the prostate. So randomizing dose escalated external beam radiation therapy to LDR prostate brachytherapy. Now, again, they're intermediate and high-risk patients by NCCN criteria. They had to have a negative metastatic workup. And there are two notable exclusion criteria. They couldn't have a PSA greater than 40 and not have clinical stage T3B disease, meaning you can't fill anything into the seminal vesicles. Now, how did they do? Well, the biochemical progression-free survival and an intent to treat analysis of the primary endpoint basically shows as a big benefit of LDI brachytherapy or a boost to external beam radiation therapy. If you look at the seven-year progression-free survival estimates, it's 75% with dose escalated external beam radiation therapy versus 86% when you add a LDI brachytherapy boost. Now, if you look at the absolute differences at five, seven, and nine years, they're 5%, 11%, and 20%. Significantly different. Less men feel by PSA when provided a brachytherapy boost. Now, let's look at the intermediate risk group, and then we'll look at the high-risk group, which is more in line of the talk, with my uh, talk today. But the important thing to point out, and this has been shown numerous times before with the Seattle Prostate Institute's data, if you don't feel by year five or six after brachytherapy, especially in the intermediate and lower settings, you typically don't. Whereas external beam radiation, there's always this sort of stepwise approach where we continue to feel as, we, uh, as time progresses. In the intermediate risk setting, the same holds up. The progression-free survivals at seven years at 80% versus 94% when we use an LDI brachytherapy boost. If you wanna look at the absolute differences at five years, it's 12%, seven years, 14%, and at nine years, 25% in favor of adding an LDI brachytherapy boost. What about the high-risk setting? Same story. At seven years, the estimate of PSA survival is 72% versus 83% in favor of LDI brachytherapy. And if you look at the absolute differences at five years, it's 2%, just showing that you have to watch these patients longer because they have higher risk disease and the potential for micrometastatic disease as well. Seven years, 11%. And at nine years, is a 20% difference in favor, absolute difference in favor of LDI brachytherapy. Now, sometimes it's important to talk the language of the colleagues that we're talking to in tumor boards. In the biochemical progression failure is defined, biochemical failure after prostatectomy is defined as a PSA of less than 0.2. So when you look at this data and use that threshold of failure, LDI brachytherapy really shows a big change in the uh, diversion in the graphs to uh, dose escalated brachytherapy with almost a 50% benefit, absolute difference. Again, this is just one threshold or one definition. So if you're looking at high risk prostate cancer and you're looking at the Ascent RT and you're looking at seven year outcomes when you do LDI brachytherapy in terms of PSA survival, we're right around 83%. Now, if we think back to what we can achieve with surgery, 
that's about 30 to 40 percent. So almost doubling our PSA control, which helps spare many men from the need for salvage therapies, which can be quite expensive and quite toxic. Now, I did say we all look at the data as we want to see it. And some will say, well, there's no overall survival difference between these two groups of patients. External beam radiation to dose escalated strategies versus using an LDL prostate brachytherapy boost. But I do remind folks this trial was not powered to detect an overall survival difference. And it is possible with longer follow-up or at a younger, younger patient population, the PSA control does increase overall survival. We can see from this interesting study that a cohort of over a thousand patients and they were followed for 10 and a half years, if you had higher intermittent risk prostate cancer and the life expectancy greater than 10 years, I mean, you're young, you're healthy and you've got some time to live, overall survival was improved when you had biochemical control. So there is evidence that PSA control increases overall survival, at least in young and healthy men. But again, we see things that we wanna see. The detractors of the study will say, well, there was just too much late grade three toxicity. The grade three toxicity in the GU perspective was 19 versus 5% as reported out. Now, half of these were structures and half were basically needing to have an intimate catheter for a period of time, and most all of this resolved. However, they were using 115 gray low dose rate brachytherapy boost to 46 gray external beam. In my practice, I use 108 gray when I use this strategy to 110 gray. So again, this is a very healthy LDR boost dose. But also too, when one started to really look at the literature, we have to understand that if we drag our seeds below the prostate, tree below the apex of the prostate, we can get into the membrane urethra, the external urinary sphincters, the GU diaphragm. And we know this is an area where we can cause strictures. We know historically membrane strictures have an instance between two to 7%. Usually 18 months after implant, the patient would come in saying, hmm, doc, it really hurts at the tip of my penis when I pee. Well, that's textbook for a stricture. So we need to really be careful of our seed drag. And this is a way that we can decrease toxicity. Now, there are many ways to identify the apex of the prostate. Now, it's very easy to see on MRI. And many of our patients now present with MRIs as part of their staging for prostate cancer. We can use this MRI and do a cognitive fusion. We know what the length of the prostate is. We can measure from the base of the apex. And when we're doing our ultrasound imaging, we can understand where the prostate ends. Another thing that I do is I sweep the prostate on sagittal imaging and I follow the contours. You can see the contours come to an end of where the prostate is. It's easier to see on a multiple, multiple planes than only on a single plane. And what I do for my residents is I take a needle on the sagittal plane, I insert my needle, I touch the capsule of the prostate. I push gently, I don't insert in, but just move the prostate around. It's an easy way to define the apex. When you know where the apex is, you're not going to give extra dose below the apex into the external urinary sphincters, GU diaphragms, and as such, your potential for structure is much, much reduced. Now, even though there is no difference in GI toxicity, those who are worried about GI toxicity, we have solutions in the radiation oncology space now. We can do hydrogel. We can do a hydrodissection, put space OAR in between the prostate and the rectal wall, and the dose will fall into the gel and not into the rectum itself, another way to decrease toxicity if this is a concern. Right now, currently in phase three randomized trial is Varigel. This will be an additional solution. So instead of going in as a liquid and polymerizing like space OAR, this will go in as a gel itself. So you can really just put it down where you need it. You can paint a little bit better. You sculpt your, um, your gel to your prostate a bit better. And if you need to go up to the similar vesicles and push those away, you can do that as well. And if you need to get down to the apex a little more, you can do that too. So in the future, maybe another product will be coming to market, but essentially doing the same thing. If we don't want dose on the rectum, we can space the prostate away from the rectum. Let the dose fall in the gel, not in the rectum. I do want to point your attention to just one more interesting retrospective cohort. This is 12 tertiary centers representing over 1,800 patients. And they were comparing the clinical outcomes of patients with Gleason score 9 and 10 disease. What they found is when they compared radical prostatectomy to external beam radiation therapy with ADT or external beam radiation plus brachytherapy and ADT, there were differences on multiple domains. The first domain was prostate cancer specific, specific survival. In the radical prostatectomy in the external beam groups, the death to prostate cancer was approximately 12 to 13%. It was only 
3% when brachytherapy was added to the treatment regimen. When you're looking at distant metastasis-free survival, we'd never want our cancers to metastasize because that's when the clock really starts to tick and the man will achieve his mortality. It was 24% in radical prostatectomy arms and external beam radiation therapy versus only 8% when brachytherapy was added to external beam technologies. So a significant improvement. When you look at five-year all-cause mortality, it was 15, it was 17 to 18% in the radical prostatectomy in the external beam groups versus only 10% when brachytherapy was a component of care. So in summary, I would say the addition of prostate brachytherapy improves biochemical control, especially when compared to external beam radiation alone. Patients with intermediate or high-risk prostate cancer receiving external beam radiation therapy plus or minus ADT should be offered brachytherapy as a dose escalation strategy because it's proven with level one evidence. And compared to surgical data, the addition of brachytherapy appears to show a biochemical advantage. Biochemical control advantages with the addition of prostate brachytherapy may translate into other oncologic and or survival endpoints. In fact, this was so important that the American Society of Clinical Oncology with the Cancer Care Ontario Joint Guideline update basically stated that for patients with high-risk prostate cancer and intermediate risk cancer patients as well, that brachytherapy should be offered in addition to external beam radiation therapy for eligible patients. I'll leave you with this thought. The truth is PSA is our tool. A rising PSA condemns many men to expensive, toxic, and quality of life reducing treatments. Is a society prepared for the co this cost to normalize overall survival? I don't think so. I think we should really consider utilizing brachytherapy in higher risk disease. Thank you very much.